Numbers chapter 13, verse 1. The Lord says to Moses, send out men which I am going to give you. So God's promise was very clear. Then they go out to the promise to rely on. They come back and look and seeing all the giants. And they come in and say, very good report. Great land, but there are giants in the land. And this is kind of where we see the leadership of Caleb. Like we heard in the previous session. Right? Dare to be different. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare, dare to stand up. And there's a lot of questions to ask is where should we be different? And I think that's kind of where I want to also highlight some of the areas where we know we need to stand up even if we're the only ones. And he quieted the whole people now. I mean, they say there were 600,000 men, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, 2 million people, if you multiply each person by a wife and a kid or two. It's about 600 times 3. It's about 2 million people. I mean, I don't know if he quieted all 2 million of them, but he quieted the people and said, we should by all means go up and, possess, and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. Right? And that's all he said. But then if you read the next chapter too, uh, they basically wept all night. Genesis chapter, sorry, Numbers chapter 14 verse 1. The congregation wept all night. I mean, talk about how depressed they must have been. And they grumbled against Moses and then they said, let's go back to Egypt. It's a bad of God. And then Moses goes to the, and Aaron go to the Lord because they uh, had that access. But Joshua and Caleb, they tear their clothes. I mean, they are violently bothered by what the people are doing. And you see what Caleb said. The land is a good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he'll give us to this land. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. The protection has been removed from them. What incredible eyes of faith to see giants when you're a grasshopper and to say they have no protection. And you see those stories throughout the Bible. You see Elisha seeing something that the servant didn't see when he was surrounded by the armies of man. You see David seeing something that the rest of the armies of Israel didn't see when he saw Goliath. You see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego seeing something that every other Israelite and the Babylonians didn't see. On, on and on you see these people of faith who are doing that. And then you see Jesus who also is our leader, our captain of, in the faith, who sees different enemies. And that's kind of why when we sing the song, bigger than all my problems, bigger than all the giants of fear and unbelief, we, it's very important for us to define what the giants are. And who are the giants we really need to stand up against? And it's fear. It's unbelief. It's not people. It's not people. So when I say, look, I don't want to please people. Absolutely right. I don't want to please people. But the real giants that Jesus stood up against, he was a friend of sin. They called him a friend of sinners. He was willing to interact with people of all kinds of different um, walks of life. But you know that he was fearless against the Pharisees, religious, as well as Pilate. So it's not only the religious people, but even the world system leaders like Pilate, he was willing to say, you have no authority over me. Your protection has been removed. Even though you just whipped me. If you read that passage in John chapter 19, Pilate has just whipped him. But he looks him in the eye and says, you have no authority over me. What do you mean? I just whipped you. I can kill you. But Jesus had different eyes to say with, true, with truth, you have no authority over me. That's a different kind of eyes that beats all logic that that is a contradictory to all human logic to a certain extent that we have to understand that and I think by seeing this we have to see the remarkable faith of Caleb and so he stood up he and Joshua but Caleb is called out because if you see later on in Luke numbers chapter 14 he says in verse 24 but my servant Caleb for whatever reason Joshua is not mentioned but Caleb is called out and um he has a different spirit. He has a different spirit from 600,000 people. Now Joshua was groomed by Moses to a certain extent. He was the leader of the army. Maybe there was more influence. But here was Caleb. And I mean, if I don't want to get into too much in the details. It doesn't even look like Caleb was from the tri 12 tribes of Israel. He became of the tribe of 
um, uh, of Judah. He represented the tribe of Judah, but if you look at him, he, I think he's called a Kenizzite or Kenite or something. And it's mentioned, that group is mentioned in Genesis chapter 15, where God told Abraham, I'll drive those people, those people, the Kenites or the Canaanites, out of the land. I'm going to give it to you. But here was Caleb, maybe not of the tribe of Israel, um, by biological birth, but having a different spirit that God said, he is going to be part of my promise. And so, I, I, the reason why I'm mentioning even Caleb's maybe different heritage is to say there may be different reasons why you may feel I'm, I'm excluded from all of God's promises or for whatever reason there can be a subtle thinking that maybe not everything is because available to me because of my physical conditions, because of my education, because of the class of society I'm from, because of my last name, for, because of my family background and heritage. Many reasons why we may give ourselves a thinking that we are out. Let me encourage you from the story of Caleb that he wasn't groomed for leadership. He wasn't seeking leadership. He was not saying, oh, excuse me, I want to be a spy. No, he was appointed to be a spy. But where his leadership stood out was when he stood out against the giants of the land. And so us identifying the giants of the land is going to be incredibly important in our own lives. And so when we are in our young ages especially, the giants of the approval of man becomes very, very big in our eyes to the point. But underneath all of that is, Lord, I want to please you. I want to have a relationship with you. And that, I would say, is the hardest fight of all, as you know, some sisters were sharing on the way home too. The hardest, the narrow road that leads to life has cliffs of worldliness and legalism on either side. And it's like a cliff, very narrow cliff on what you're walking on. And there's legalism on one side and there's worldliness on the other. The spirit of the Pharisees and the spirit of Herod. And Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, beware of the leaven of Herod. It's a leaven. You know what leaven is? Yeast. How much yeast, yeast do you need to puff up a whole you know, pound of flour or whatever it is. Small, small little things. That's all that's needed. That's what Jesus was saying. Beware of the leaven, small little pieces of worldliness or legalism. And it's a hard battle. And I'm sure all of you, in, in my own life, my teens were driven by being raised with wonderful teaching, but what, the way it came into me was legalistic. I'll give you a practical example. I went to college in America and for the first time I saw Christians who were wearing jewelry in my community. And I wrote them off. I said, clearly they can't be spiritual. They're wearing jewelry. And it was a real shock to my system when I saw them way more spiritual than I was. Women my age had a true devotion to the Lord. But that was an evidence of a legalistic attitude that had come into me. And so, what, is, what did I do in response to that? In my 20s, it was a pulling away from legalism, but falling over on the other side into worldliness. Being all things to all men, because I was wanting to not displease them, because I didn't want to be legalistic. That was always my good reason for not coming, you know, being harder on uh, certain issues and things like that. And so, you know, for lack of a better word, it was kind of like a pendulum. I kept going back and forth. And it's gotten a little better over the years. So my encouragement to you is keep walking that way. And um, one caveat about, one, one, one sobering thought about the pendulum, even as I say, don't give up, as you will fall on either side from time to time and you repent, is one important note to know about this is Jesus never fell. That is not to condemn you, but that is to make you adore him more. 
That is to just, I'm not saying that to say, well, be like Jesus and don't ever fall into it. I don't have the grace to say that because I didn't do it. I still find myself being in an active struggle on this narrow, that word for narrow is constricted, afflicted way. Narrow is the way that leads to life. That word is actually pressed in. And the more comfortable one is to go into legalism. The more comfortable one is to go on the short run into worldliness. Either one of those things. The afflicted way is the way to life. And the only balance I would say is figure out how that pendulum can swing less and less. The only balance I would say to that is Jesus never had that. He always walked that narrow way. And so rather than that ever beating you up, because that's what the devil wants to do, condemnation. Let that make you adore him and convince you more and more that he is the one who is worth following. He is the one mediator between God and man. The man, Jesus Christ. That's what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2. The mediator between God and man is the man, Jesus Christ. He was fully God. But Paul underlined that word, the man, Jesus Christ, because he was saying, look, it was like you and me. And he never went down that pendulum. And Caleb had that spirit. And then in Joshua chapter 14, I'll just share a couple of other things. You can meditate a lot about that because this is also something that uh, we want to spend this one hour having time for questions or sharing other thoughts. But in Joshua chapter 14, Caleb comes in and says that, um, you see that in word, you know, I'll just point you to this. In Joshua chapter 14 verse 6, it talks about Joshua in Gilgal and Caleb the son of Jephune the Kenizzite. So Joshua, Caleb's father was a Kenizzite. Go look that word up, Kenizzite, and see where that word is found. You'll find it, I believe, in Genesis, Genesis chapter 15. You know the word which the Lord spoke to Moses, and he basically says um, that this is what the Lord spoke to Moses. Now then, verse 12, read that. Now, now then, give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day, 40 years ago. Caleb is like, I have not forgotten that. I'm not done. I still am holding on to God's promise from 40 years ago. And God promised that this would be mine. And um, God gave him those territories. And I love that humility in which he says in verse, at the end of verse 12, perhaps the Lord will be with me. Um, maybe it will be for me to do it. Um, but he always had that. Perhaps even in the Numbers 14, he says, if the Lord is pleased with us, he'll give those people into the land. So as sure he was with God's promises, he knew, hey, look, I need to walk before the Lord. I, want, I need to keep my, my um, garments pure. And um, yeah, you see that, in, that he gave, gave up, um, that Caleb ended up getting that land. And that was the hardest land to overcome, the one with the greatest giants that they had. And so young people, if in our pursuit of God, Bigger than all my problems, bigger than all my fears, God is bigger. It's not, it's an easy song for us to sing now, it's an upbeat song. But there's a, there's some pretty hard, it's a pretty hard road. And we have some wonderful examples of one or two in the Old Testament who had that stance. And so, I mean, those are my introductory thoughts. A couple of thoughts more I would have for Caleb, about Caleb if we have time. But I um, want to also kind of give... It's 20 minutes um, in, so I'll just open it up for any of the other elders who want to add anything to it, but and or, and or, right, if somebody has a question. So if you have a question about it or anything you'd like to uh, say, please feel free to do it. We'd like it to be lively and not lots of moments of silence. And I don't mean that to say that God's promises are not true. It's just to say that, that perhaps part of that was, the point with that is, Lord, your promises are true, but I need to walk in your ways. I need to walk humbly before you. Um, if I have been at this in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Even if I'm claiming God's promises. If I have selfish ambition and empty conceit and ask God for prosperity, quoting all of God's promises, there is that check to God's promises that we must have. Not to sow doubt, but to say, Lord, I want to walk before you in claiming these promises.
Can anybody think of anybody else? I mentioned a few. I mentioned David. I mentioned Daniel. I mentioned Jesus. Anybody else? Any other person that comes to your mind, Old Testament, New Testament, who stood alone in a particular instance? One or two? Sorry? Joseph. Joseph, Great example. Who did he stand up against? Uh, Wonderful. Wonderful. Great example. Stephen against the religious authorities. Noah, great example, against millions of people talking about a flood which had never been, building a big boat on dry land. So these are great examples to uh, meditate on and to take that word in Hebrews chapter 12 in the context of saying, I have a great cloud of witnesses and to put the people you've mentioned, you know, the Josiahs, the Antipasses, the and so on and so forth. Like they're watching me saying, Lord of the Old Testament saints, I didn't get what was promised. You get to get what is promised. And then looking unto Jesus, who puts all of them, can I say, to shame by his faith. That is the adoration that we can then say, wow, let me think about Paul. Let me think about Noah. Let me think about Joseph. What radical faith. Hey, I want to be like them. But they don't hold a candle to Jesus and his light. So when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he stands so different. And these are ways in which even reading the Old Testament saints can see the so much greater light of Jesus. Even though he never killed a giant on the outside, he was nonstop killing giants on the inside. Every thought that stood up against the will of his father. I'll defer to other people. I'll give you some starter thoughts. It's a, such a complicated decision yeah. in your growth. Um, counsel from people you respect, not counsel from people who are respected. Two different things. Other people may respect them. You may not. People that you respect and trust, I think that's a good guidance. Asking God to speak through them in something they may say. That is, so that others you can get into an echo chamber where you just listen to yourself. Um, the only thing serious is sin was mentioned earlier. It's a very important guidance to say, Lord, if it's a sin, I definitely don't want to do it. But then I have believed that I don't have to be afraid of making a mistake. Because if it's not a sin, what is it? Even if it's not best. If it's a mistake, God will work it out for good. As long as I have a sincere and pure heart. Uh, blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. Not blessed are the ones who get things exactly right in every decision they make in the tactical decisions. Lord, I want to have a pure heart before you. I don't want to be driven by ego. I don't want to be driven by reaction to legalism or reaction to worldliness. I just want to please you. I don't want to cause other people to stumble. He who knows what is right to do and not, does not do it, to him it is sin. Anything not done of faith is sin. There's so many different parts to this that it complicates things. That um, as you're growing in maturity, uh, this is how these are some of the things that I've I've tried to use as my guide. But I'll open it up to other uh, of the leaders here too to also share anything else. Yeah, I mean I think it's it's a complicated area because the conscience can be so influenced by our culture. Uh, our conscience could have been it's been corrupted, you know, and it says that the blood of Jesus sprinkles our conscience clean. To be able to serve the living God. But I think it is something that we need to go to God to keep helping us. I think that's kind of why a community of believers is so important. In contrast to the culture of this world, Christian world, that says, I just need God. I, just, I, don't, need a good, I don't need a church. It doesn't matter what kind of church to go to. I just need a church that gives me good music and a good message. No. God wanted us to be like a family because that's how he brought children into the world. Children don't know how to do these things. And sadly, Jesus also wept when he looked, or he was, I don't know if he wept, but he definitely was really troubled when he saw all these sheep, but no shepherd. He said, the harvest is plentiful, but no families. It was like he was looking at a bunch of orphans and no godly leaders in different pockets to help these sheep. And so there's a, the, the problem that you're pointing out would be less 
if there were just a healthy family where there were people who were in their 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s who can guide the people in their teens and the 20s. And that's, so I think even if the answer is not per, is best to answer your question, at least you can say, Lord, there's a great need for churches, local churches, where it's the family of God, cross-generational. Yes, there's the needs of the teens and 20s, but there's such a need for the 40s and the 50s. People who can take us teens and 20s under their wing, not because they want to dominate, because they want to shepherd them. And that's what touched my heart about it as I was going through different churches. It didn't solve the problem. I still struggle with that. Right? The same very problem that you deal with. Should I do it? I don't have a problem in my conscience about it. Somebody else has written an article or a blog about it and like, I don't feel it's okay. Right? And so it's a, but I think the people that God puts in my life and whom I trust help with that in that journey. Um, but as, without being paranoid. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 that's, that, that's where I, that's the verse I was quoting thank you for asking if I didn't if there's any verse that I quote I could quote it wrong <laughs> especially if I don't look it up Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 there's a, there's, there's a lot to kind of meditate on this verse how much more will the blood of Christ he's talking about different kinds of the blood of lambs and goats compared to the blood of Christ. But the expression that he uses here is, through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God to cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So it's the blood of Jesus that is helping our conscience not have dead works. Not just doing things because somebody told you to do it. To serve the living God. So the blood of Jesus can help my conscience too. That has been affected and polluted sometimes by culture, by legalistic attitudes. You know, it's wrong to show your wrist or it's wrong. There many different things that we may sometimes laugh at, but it's the real burden that some people deal with. Uh, but at every level, we're living with that. But I cannot underline enough, our conscience seeking to be pure and being informed by God's word and godly people that we trust must be our guide. And willingness to say, God, I've grown to maturity. It, I'd honestly, before you can tell you, I opened up my conscience before you and it didn't bother me. Five years later, I see things differently. But I'm not going to uh, condemn myself about it. I was pure in what I did before, as far as I can tell. Walk in the light. Micah, you had a question or point. Yeah, Comment. Can you That's Jeremy's expression. I mean, I'd say that is you can go into such a over rotate into constantly thinking, but it's probably realistic. It's probably legalistic. I'm probably offending somebody, probably doing something, or I'm clearly offending God in so many different ways. Um, I've put, I brought paranoia into different parts of my life. Like, how do you know you're filled with the Holy Spirit? I, I associate, I'm talking about me, CFC born and bred. In my 20s, I used to think that being filled with the Holy Spirit, when I asked God to fill me with the Holy Spirit, I waited for a physical evidence. And the physical evidence was my hair standing at the back of my neck. I really did. I, not all the time, but when I used to pray, I was like, Lord, I really want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If my hair stood at the back of my neck, I knew. The Lord has answered my prayer. Can you believe it? But I, so I became paranoid when the hair didn't stand up on the back of my neck. And I have hair in the back of my neck, so I had, that couldn't, couldn't eliminate that. But it didn't, so I, so I became paranoid. And I didn't go to God's word to definitively smash that idea. I'll tell you, even now, think about when you're singing. And you start feeling emotional. Does that mean God's speaking to you? I don't know, you, you think about that. And I can see all the, I'm not saying he is or he isn't. But what if he isn't? What if you're not crying? Does that mean he's not speaking to you? And so we, I just learned to not be paranoid. Yeah, I actually do think that something that at NCCF I have at least felt and we tried to build this is, um, if your brother sins against you, 
You know what the rest of that verse is or something? You know the essence of it? You should go and talk to him. I feel like a healthy community doesn't just forgive. I'm not saying they shouldn't forgive. That's not full obedience to scripture. If your brother sins against you, you should go and talk to them. And so I think that's the balance to me, I feel, in a healthy community to save, protect us from being paranoid. Did I say something that offended Olu in my conversation with yesterday? I don't know. Probably might have, but I could be totally paranoid, right? Because he didn't smile at me like a big, big smile when he saw me today. He clearly has something wrong. Well, the instruction is, look, just come and talk to me. And I think it's an onus on both of us. Like, if you bothered me in something you said, I feel like I have a responsibility to come to you too. And that should be the way in which we do it. Is There's the expectation of, look, if I have something that I felt like really bothered me, I'll, be doing, I'll do it, but I don't want to be paranoid. But I also have this, this confidence now, if he has something against me, I want to be as open to saying, I'm not going to be defensive or like, no, I'm, I'm so sorry that you felt that way. I honestly didn't mean it that way, but I'll pay attention to that, the way I wink or the way I, you know, smile in that way. I didn't mean to laugh at your family. You know, things can be misunderstood. So that's my encouragement to be in the balances. I guess let's see if the, if the believers especially, then, well, I can say that, okay, I tell you, you're very smart, you're more spiritual, but see, you should just die to yourself. It's something that was necessarily bringing up with people to offend somebody. It's not like if I offend somebody or something I say, it's not necessarily I think in a community, it's not just dying to yourself. Yeah. Because that's not all of scripture. I must die to myself so I don't get offended. Yeah. But it can hurt. <laughs> to where I can say, look, if you, if you, the verse in scripture is very clear. If your brother sins against you, yeah. talk to them. So I think it's taking all of scripture dying to yourself and talking to them because we're being of help to one another in community, not trying to throw a stone at them, emptying your pockets of all stones, but saying, look, I want this to be a trusting relationship. And it takes emotional maturity. <laughs> Some things that I didn't have in my teens or my 20s or my 30s. And I think I over-rotated on dying to self. I can tell you that from my own thing. I was too much dying to self without ever speaking up. And I don't think that's been the healthy answer that I have right now, at least is we're trying to have a whole um, healthy church. If you can't run back to him, walk back to him. If you want, can't walk, walk back to him, crawl back to him. If you can't crawl back to him, just turn towards him. Um, I, I've, I wrote that in 20... Five years ago when I was feeling I don't have the energy to walk back to you. I failed you too many times. And the thought was I'm, I'm going to come crawling back to you. One crawl at a time. I don't know how the prodigal son came back to him. But he was eating pig's food. He was not the strongest of all people back then. He maybe crawled back to God. Um, but coming back to God is the definition of success. Not victory over sin. Turning to God is the definition of success. I get that from James chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it all joy when you face many trials because the testing of your faith produces not giving up. That's what it will produce in you, not giving up. That's success. And not giving up will have its perfect result where you'll be perfect lacking in nothing. So victory over sin will come along the way. But the definition of the first definition of success for the Christian is not giving up. Which means everybody sitting here is a, a raging success. Put that label over your head right now. Because you're here. You've not given up. Start with that label by the authority of God's word. And sit on God's lap with the def that definition of you and work out your issues with him. Identity is important. Let me share one other thought with you about uh, Caleb, G Joshua chapter 15, the next chapter. It says that Caleb did do what God had promised him and so clearly he was pleasing to God. The perhaps was uh, guaranteed. And, but then I want to just show you that Rook, the theme is a new generation. So Caleb kicked out who was going to do this. But Caleb was not interested in kicking out all the people alone himself. 
He was 85 years old. He could have done it. He says, I can do it. I'm still as strong. But see what he says in verse 16. Joshua chapter 15, verse 16. Caleb said, I'm not satisfied to go and kick out these things. I want the next generation. He says, I will give my daughter to the one who goes and kicks out the giant. Caleb clearly said, I can do it. He was not afraid. He was interested in the next generation. He says, I, who's going to come and me and kill that? And so this guy, Othniel, verse 17, went and did it. And he got his daughter, Caleb's daughter. And Caleb's daughter also says, has the same spirit as Caleb. is like, I want more from you, dad. And to me, spiritually, I say, Lord, I want more from you. I want to take more of those giants. I want to, um, I want what all that the Lord has promised. And what a wonderful spirit I felt. I have a daughter. What a wonderful spirit to say, hey, who should I be raising my daughter to be like? And who should be the man who would marry my daughter? And so for all the sisters here, um, somebody who's giant killers in your matrimonial profile. What are you looking for? Giant killer. <coughs> Reference. Joshua chapter 15. I'm joking. Do, do what you wish. But I hope you get the spiritual essence of what I'm trying to say here. And us men need to be giant killers. And when uh, the women come and walk around us, they may not see us being the buffest person or the most athletic person. But he's a giant killer. He's got the giants of fear and unbelief. It's pretty clear. He's crushing them. And that's the attitude we must be having as men, as we have to be supposed to be having women, and it's women too. Caleb's daughter was also raised with that same mindset of having it. And Othniel ended up being the first judge of Israel. It's written that in Judges. He became the first judge of Israel. So you see Moses picking somebody who was not even from the tribes of Israel. God calling him out. God selecting him to fight the greatest giants in that land. And then Caleb also picking somebody who was not his relative. Some other random guy called Othniel because he was a giant killer. Saying so you see the lineage of a new generation that seeks God's face. Psalm 24 verse 6. Let me end with that. And we can ask a few more minutes for questions too. Is Psalm 24 verse 6. He says, uh, that's where this verse is from. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Let's not forget the words that came after that. Even Jacob. Now, Jacob is a blessed name now. But Jacob, that word means grabber because he grabbed on the Esau's thing it wasn't a positive looking title back then when the first Jacob was made even Jacob's what's the labels that you have in your name associated with you based on your background based on all the feedback you've been given over the years from parents or teachers or even church elders this is a new generation that seeks my face even Jacob and then right after that is the word Selah which means don't go any further. You need to meditate on that. Wait, even this Jacob, even this guy, who's failed God in so many ways, grabbing this, doing that, even that I can be part of that generation who seeks God's face. And then pause, musical interlude, stop the music, meditate on it. Then verse 7, you're ready to go to verse 7. Lift up your heads that the king of glory can come in. So take that in. Are you really part of that new generation that will see God's face? Yes, you can be. You mean like despite me being the Jacob of all Jacobs? Yes. Well, pause. Really take that in and see that you have the right password to go and sit on God's lap. That you can go boldly because of what Christ has done. Then you can lift up your heads. But I've, it's worth a pause in your meditations as you're going to think about this later. That's kind of why the church is so important. And it's, you know, learn, run with endurance looking up unto Jesus, right? So it's definitely the vertical, but also the horizontal, which is why we have been so passionate about both. Um, that is why we are not trying to build allegiance to come join our church and this and that. But we don't know any other way. And it sounds to be in scripture. If you read Hebrews chapter 12 verse 13. You say that's why we've come to Mount Zion. Not to Mount Sinai. But we've come to Zion which is a picture of the church. In that same passage Hebrews chapter 12. Worth reading. 
in context of all the things before that in faith. Uh, don't continue sinning, Hebrews chapter 12. Come to Mount Zion. Don't forsake the discipline of the Lord when he takes you through trials of different things. Don't let a root of bitterness rise up within you. Look unto Jesus and run the road with endurance. So there are these themes. And there's, let's come to Mount Zion. It's a body. And so it's a group. It's a marathon race. But it's a group marathon race. And the perspective of it's a group marathon relay race. I'm going to pass it on to somebody else. And so those are the, the words that have helped me. It's a marathon race. It's a group marathon race. Caleb's is an example of that. So seek that. It may not be many. Matthew 7, narrow is the gate and afflicted is the way. That is the way I think New King James says it. I like that better than narrow is the gate and narrow is the way. I appreciate it. Even in Jesus' words, he's saying broad is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the gate and afflicted is the way that leads to life. Um, you read that in the Amplified Version that is pressed in. So if I told you it's going to be a hard, you're being baptized? All right. Next 50 years is going to be afflicted. You know. For the joy set before you, you endure the cross. I think that's absolutely affliction is. Sinai is a picture of the old covenant mindset where God spoke from Mount Sinai and gave the Ten Commandments and said, Thou shalt. And I look at Mount Sinai as saying, God has said it, so we will. It will, it will be so for us. That's why Jesus also said, when you pray, pray like this, give us. It was us in us, not me. So there's two components of it. It's not thou shalt, but we will. We will uphold this together. I'll just give you my short answer, but it's a, it's a, I, everybody's got the answer. I used to wonder why Paul said the greatest of all of these is love. And so 1 Corinthians 13, I brushed over it. Um, but it's worth a lot of meditation. 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient. Not love is liking everybody. Love is kind. Love endures. Love does not brag. Love does not take into account wrong suffered. There's a lot to meditate in its balance that I feel like I've still scratched the surface at it. But true divine love um, does not mean I have to enjoy or like or even trust them. God says love your enemies. God doesn't say trust your enemies. So there, there's a lot of wisdom that we must have in even love. And we look unto Jesus, who loved the Pharisees, died for them, but clearly didn't like anything they were doing. And so I think it's worth a lot of conversation and meditation. 1 Corinthians 13, there are a lot of, this can be thought about it. And, um, it's at time though. So not to brush off your question, and it's a tremendously deep question. Probably the hardest one to do is, how do I properly love? Because Jesus said the whole thing can come down to this, love one another as I have loved you. That's it. So I can just take that one verse, and I don't need pretty much anything else in the Bible. And pretty much you could just do that, and you're set. So it's the deepest of all to love as Christ loved us. Mm -hmm.